la bestialidad imperialista. Bestialidad que no tiene una frontera determinada ni pertenece a un país determinado. Bestias fueron las hordas hitleristas, como bestias son los norteamericanos hoy, como bestias son los paracaidistas belgas, como bestias fueron los imperialistas franceses en Argelia. Porque es la naturaleza del imperialismo la que bestializa a los hombres, la que la convierte en fieras sedientas de sangre que están dispuestas a degollar, a asesinar, a destruir hasta la última imagen de un revolucionario, de un partidario de un régimen que haya caído bajo su bota o que luche por su libertad. Y la estatua que recuerda a Lumumba, hoy destruida pero mañana reconstruida, nos recuerda también en la historia trágica de ese mártir de la revolución del mundo, que no se puede confiar en el imperialismo, pero ni tantito así, nada. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 22, Unmasking Imperialism, Exposing Imperialist Propaganda in Mainstream Media. Today, the truth about North Korea, AKA the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, the DPRK. And joining us today is my homie, my comrade, Flame of Liberation, an anti-imperialist activist. Please subscribe to the Flame of Liberation. Was actually my first guest on Unmasking Imperialism and somebody a regular on this show. And I love talking to this dude every time. He has, he's like an encyclopedia of knowledge, especially when it comes to uh, the Middle East and Asia and, and anti-imperialism in general. How's it going, comrade? Uh, thank you. Great to be with you again. No problem, man. And it's it's good to be talking to you. I mean, this is something I've been wanting to to speak with you for a while about the DPRK. We're both somebody, we're both people who for many years, even when I was living in New York a few years ago, we were one of the few youth anti-imperialist activists who were adamant about defending DPRK, defending North Korea from imperialist aggression. And something we were talking about before the stream started is that it's not really trendy within the quote unquote left, the Western left, I would say, to defend DPRK from imperialism, from agitation. Unfortunately, you'll find people who are in solidarity with Cuba or, or Venezuela or the, Pan the Black Panthers but then when it comes to DPRK, they're kind of like, eh, or they may not necessarily even know about it or want to show love for the DPRK, even though the leaders of the Cuban revolution, the Bolivarian revolution, even the Sandinista revolution in Nicaragua, and the Black Panthers, Huey Newton, have visited DPRK and are in complete solidarity with the, the Korean people against imperialist aggression. And so much of that is not really known in the West. And so I think it's important for us to talk about that today, to have this conversation about the truth about North Korea, DPRK, give a, a real history of, of the nation resisting imperialism. And I couldn't think of anybody uh, better to, to talk about this with, because again, you know, you have so much knowledge and information about this. So before we get into talking about the actual history of the DPRK, why don't you Tell us for you personally, like what for you, what opened your eyes to a lot of the false narratives about the DPRK? What brought you to learn more about the reality of it? Yeah, I was actually I was quite young uh, when it was quite early when I was getting into politics when I was in high school. Um, and honestly, doing research online, seeing a lot of stuff on YouTube, actually, and seeing you know, certain alternative information and then just sort of, you know, looking into it further with other sources and verifying it and finding out, you know, it, it's quite when you find out that, you know, what you've been told about North Korea is a lie. It's it's like a real it, it, that's a huge thing because uh, the propaganda against North Korea is so strong and um, especially like during the Bush years and uh during the Obama years, like the the anti North Korea propaganda was so strong and so heavy, and you're constantly, you know, 
brainwashed into thinking, you know, through the media that North Korea is some aggressive, crazy uh, country um, that is trying to get nuclear weapons for no reason whatsoever. Uh, and they just they they're just a, a, a threat to the world, supposedly. That's the way it was portrayed. But when you actually look into the history and you look into what happened, you know, in the Korean War and since then, it's absolutely the opposite, really. Everything, you know, it might sound crazy to someone who hasn't, doesn't know the history, but if you look into this stuff, it's like the complete opposite. North Korea, what they've been doing is defensive. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the things that really, even before I knew too much, one of the things that really I thought was something that made me think about it was, you know, the situation in Korea, even without knowing too much about it, if you think of it like just North Korea versus South Korea, not even getting into like which one's legitimate government or not, from, you know, just from a basic perspective, that's like an internal issue. Why is it that the United States is intervening in an internal issue, like a civil war, so to speak? How would the United States have liked it if some other much more powerful country came in in the U.S. Civil War and sided with the South against the North, just like what happened in the Korean War. So that was something that really made me think about it. Most definitely. And I think for me, one thing that really opened my eyes to the DPRK uh, in 2011, I think it was 2011 when Kim Jong-il passed away, that it was so much parody and humor. It was really disgusting seeing in Western media how they were everybody like it was a complete alignment right liberal media conservative media social media everybody was just making fun of this guy and all these memes that's when memes started becoming popular and i was like hmm if everybody's on the same page in demonizing this one person like what is what what did this person really do what is this person really about and as I started looking into the history of the DPRK and, and propaganda and how Korea was divided, right? The Korean nation is one nation that was divided by the imperialists. And seeing that, it was just really eye-opening for me to be like, wow, these are the people, the people that we're told to make fun of, the people that we're told to vilify are actually our friends, people who are resisting the same uh, empires and corporate powers that are oppressing and colonizing us. And it's just like, looking into that, I was just like, wow, like everything we've been told is a complete lie. And learning about how over 3 million people were murdered by the imperialists in the, in the Korean War or what they call it, the Korean War in the West was really eye-opening for me. And so I think like around that time, that's when I was also learning about socialism and communism. And I also really appreciated the fact that DPRK didn't want to take as hard of a side on the Sino-Soviet split that they tried to unify the socialist camp as much as they could. And then I started reading Kim Il-sung and I was like, wow, this guy's a fucking genius. Like he was a playwright. He was a guerrilla fighter revolution. Like he was just everything, you know, and, and just like seeing that and like, wow, like that's so cool. And in my opinion, like Kim Il-sung is one of the most underrated communists in, in the, the communist movement. He was, a genius and so from then i started kind of really learning more um shout out to uh, comrade b level comrade orlando anthony to christina itzel oliver everybody who's watching listening please share this if you haven't already to spread the truth about the dprk so comrade before we um also please make sure to subscribe to flame of liberation uh his channel is in the description um before we start i want to share a clip with you because you, you've probably seen a million of these videos. They're all over YouTube. They're like an inside look into, you know, DP, uh, North Korea. And so this is one, this is the generic history that we get in the West about uh, DPRK. So I'm going to play this and then get your response and hear from you about the real history of the DPRK. But this is the standard narrative that we hear in the West. We're constantly hearing threats from North Korea. But what's behind all of that? Let's find out. This is the modern history of North Korea. The Korean Empire ruled the entire Korean Peninsula until 1910. That's when the more powerful Japanese army took control through a treaty. When Japan was defeated to end World War II, the peninsula was split between the Soviet Union and the United States. 
The Soviets installed Kim Il-sung as the leader of the North, now known as the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. In 1950, Kim's North invaded the South and would have overrun the entire peninsula if the American-led UN hadn't stepped in with 340,000 soldiers. This re-energized South Korean side, then counterattacked and drove the North Koreans back toward the Yalu River. That's when China, led by Chairman Mao, poured more than a million troops onto the North side. With 2.5 million soldiers now opposing each other on both sides, the battlefield was crowded, and fighting devolved into grinding trench warfare. A ceasefire was reached in 1953, but without a signed peace treaty, the North and South officially remain at war to this day, which is why we have a permanent standoff along the 38th parallel called the Demilitarized Zone, or DMZ for short. Sadly, this is pretty much the same stretch of land that separated the North and South before the war broke out and 2.2 million people died or were wounded. Even though he failed in his attempt to control all of Korea, Kim Il-sung remained in power for 40 more years. He established a totalitarian cult of personality and shut his people off from interacting with the rest of the world. The North was even further isolated when the Soviet Union was dissolved. This also almost collapsed North Korea's economy. And unfortunately for the people of North Korea, economic hardship came right as a severe flood wiped out many of the country's crops. The government let this turn into a widespread famine that lasted more than three years and killed as many as 3.5 million people. In the middle of the crisis in 1994, Kim Il-sung died. His son, Kim Jong-il, became the supreme leader. And he went right along with and continued many of his father's policies, including the military first strategy that has seen the DPRK's active fighting force become the fourth largest in the world. In 2006, the North successfully tested its first nuclear weapon, and then began threatening its neighbors with it as a way to preserve the regime's credibility in the eyes of its own people, and as a way of extorting food aid from other nations. In 2011, Kim Jong-il died, and his youngest son, Kim Jong-un, was selected as supreme leader. As a show of strength by its new leader, North Korea began issuing stern threats against both the South and the United States, including a promise to strike the American West Coast with nuclear missiles. US President Barack Obama has chosen not to reward the North's belligerents in a no-deal-making policy known as strategic patience. With the recent history of uprisings toppling dictators in parts of the world where democracy seemed like a total fantasy only a few years ago, the choice to wait North Korea out seems wise. So that's some of the nonsense that uh, that's the traditional, that's the dominant mainstream narrative about the DPRK. We see it everywhere. First of all, the the music, I, I did a stream with, uh, with B-Level about this a few weeks back. The eerie music, right? The, mm -hmm. the creepy music. You have uh, Kim Jong-un like walking over bread as if, you know, just everything like that, the symbolism, the language, your your response and, and tell us about, you know, your response and then tell us the real history of the DPRK. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, that, that's, that's the type of thing you're used to seeing. Like when they talk about the DPRK, um, you know, it's interesting what they decide to talk about, what they decide not to talk about. Um, it's interesting. They say, uh, you know, supposedly quote, uh, the Soviets installed Kim Il-sung supposedly that's their line. Uh, well, who was in South Korea? They, they don't make any mention of that. They don't say the U S installed, uh, Sigmund Rhee in South Korea, who was in fact a nobody, unlike Kim Il-sung. Kim Il-sung was loved by the Korean people as a Korean patriot who fought for the country's independence against the Japanese imperialists. Um, so they decide to talk about that. Um, they make no mention of the fact, you know, none of the details about the Korean War, They and they try and make it seem as though the North started it, which it's way more complicated than that. The North did not start the war. Um, and, uh, top, you know, U S historians even acknowledge that like Bruce Cummings, that it's, it's way more complicated and you can't just say that the North started the war, even from like top American historians. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, the, the whole way they portray it is, you know, it, it's the standard bullshit propaganda that unfortunately to the average viewer might go, you know, seen as oh it's just normal you know but once you actually know what's going on it's like layer on top of layer of bullshit just in that short bit of information um 
you know, one interesting little fact kind of away from like North Korea, but as far as like Korean history and especially U.S. Korean relations, the first time the United States fought against Korea was actually long before North Korea. It was long before uh, the Soviet Union, long before People's Republic of China. The first armed conflict that the United States came into with Korea was all the way back in 1871, which was against the, uh, the Joseon Kingdom of Korea. Again, all the way back in 1871, that was the, the U.S. invaded Korea, um, which uh, was, they were attempting to open up Korea. Korea was had like a, um, around that time, the United States was like moving into uh, Japan and the Pacific and stuff. And um, Korea didn't, Korea had an isolationist policy at that point. And the United States was like trying to open up Korea, force Korea to, uh, open up to so-called free trade, uh, mm. basically imperialism. And I think that's a very important fact because, you know, the, the Korean War wasn't the first time. And all the way back in 1871, the U.S. had attacked Korea in a clearly colonialist, uh, expansionist move uh, to try and force Korea to uh, trade with the United States. Um, but... As far as like getting into like the history of North Korea, South Korea, the Korean War, and all that stuff, uh, you really need to go back to the 1930s. And again, Kim Il Sung, um, he uh, had fled to uh, Manchuria after the um, Japanese invasion of Korea when he was very young. And uh, Koreans are uh, the homeland of the Koreans is the Korean Peninsula, but there is. A huge amount of Koreans uh, in Manchuria and also in Russia. Um, going back like long before the Russian Revolution, there were a lot of Russians in Korea. Uh, a lot of sorry, the opposite. There were a lot of Koreans in Russia, um, and there were a lot of Koreans in Manchuria. And so Kim Il Sung had fled to Korea to escape the Japanese, um, along with a lot of Koreans, and he was organizing uh, resistance. Uh, uh, student resistance first when he was very young against the Japanese imperialists and then eventually when the Japanese invaded uh, Manchuria he organized the Korean People's Revolutionary Army in Manchuria and he was one of the fiercest leaders of the anti-Japanese resistance in Manchuria and China. He was well known as a very strong fighter and his fighters were very revered and feared uh, by the Japanese. The Japanese were very scared of him and uh, they, they expended a lot of resources trying to hunt him down, and they couldn't. And, um, and the, that fighting uh, for the liberation of Korea against Japanese imperialism, uh, that eventually, along with the Soviet and Mongolian uh, forces, uh, the Korean revolutionaries, along with the Soviets and Mongolians, liberated Korea, uh, first Manchuria, um, in August of 1945, and then Korea uh, in August. And um, that's something that's almost never talked about in U.S. history in World War II. In U.S. World War II history, the way it's taught, first of all, um, there's a total understatement of the Soviet role. World War II, the Soviet Union, was that was the biggest, most important part of World War II. Uh, the, the most deaths in any war in human history, somewhere between 25 to 20 million Soviets died in that. Um, according to the U.S. government, U.S. military, 80% of the German army was destroyed by the Soviet Red Army. So it was 80% according to the U.S. military. So the Soviets are the ones who destroyed Nazi Germany. I mean, that's just, that's not me saying that. That's not uh, the Soviets saying that that's the U.S. military that says that on record. But so there's the U.S. history downplays the Soviet role in World War II generally against the Germans. But even even more than that, most Americans probably don't aren't even aware that the Soviets fought against Japan. And it wasn't just a minor thing. Uh, the Soviet move, the Soviet and Mongolian move into Manchuria to drive out the Japanese from Manchuria. Manchuria was the most important colony to Imperial Japan. There are so many resources in Manchuria. And what actually eventually led to the U.S. war with Japan 
was a conflict between the U.S. and Japan over China. So Manchuria and China was really like the center of like what the whole war with Japan was about. And the Soviets and the Mongolians, along with the Chinese and Korean revolutionaries, um, defeated the Japanese there. They had massive armed forces there, a uh, huge army there. And the Soviets and Mongolians and Chinese and Koreans liberated it and liberated Korea. And uh, interestingly, uh, the Soviets in a very, in very, you know, despite all the propaganda against Stalin, you know, it's called it's claimed that he's an expansionist and everything. He uh, could have had the Soviet army and the Korean communists taken over all of Korea right away, no problem, because the United States was not there. The United States was, uh, the United States wasn't able to land in Korea for a little while after that. The Soviet forces actually stopped at the agreed upon parallel and agreed that the United States could move into the southern part, even though the Soviets had the full capacity to keep moving and the United States wouldn't have been able to been there for quite a while afterwards. Um, so the Soviets showed a very, uh, uh, they were very conciliatory. And uh, despite that, uh, once the United States got into South Korea, uh, they, they didn't repay the Soviets and the Koreans uh, for their, um, their, uh, 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 their goodwill, you know, allowing the U.S. to even be in South Korea in the first place. Um, the United States uh, installed uh, a leader, uh, Syngman Rhee, and uh, uh, started to uh, purge the uh, Korean patriots and leftists and communists in the South. Um, prior to, a little bit before the U.S. got there and established the puppet government in the South, there were actually people's committees forming all over South Korea and Korea in general. Uh, calling for like legitimate elections, including Kim Il Sung and including others, like actual real elections. Uh, but when the U.S. got there and installed the puppet government in the South, they cracked down heavily and installed basically a dictatorship in the South. And they had a, a, a full, ele a fake election uh, without Kim Il Sung and without the progressive and patriotic forces in the South. They destroyed those movements in the South and carried out actual horrendous massacres. Um, you could look at, look at the, uh, the Bodo League massacre and other massacres that happened in South Korea, so many massacres. And in the United States, Americans don't really know about this, but you know who does know about this? The South Koreans know about this actually. They know this very well because um, I believe in the 90s, uh, there was a whole uh, truth and reconciliation push and it's very well known, the dark history of what happened with the uh, South Korean dictatorship. There was no equivalent to that in the North. The North was not carrying out these horrendous massacres. That was going on in the South. And so the stage was set for hostility between the North and the South, uh, with the North, Kim Il-sung, the revolutionary patriot, uh, hero of Koreans for his bravery and heroism fighting against the Japanese for a long time in the 30s and 40, early 40s. Um, and uh, with the South Korean government, you had the U.S. install this guy, Syngman Rhee, and the generals and the other leaders around him, these people were act like literal traitors. They were traitors to Korea. These are people who fought on the side of Japan against the Koreans. These generals and other like top people in the South Korean government, they... You could look them up on Wikipedia even, and they have like a section on allegiance, and you'll see allegiance, Manchukuo, which was the Japanese puppet state in Manchuria, which is basically Japan, and some even like directly Empire of Japan. So they fought for Manchukuo, which was a Japanese puppet state against the Korean revolutionaries. Some of them even took Japanese names. Um, and, you know, wore Japanese uniforms and, every, you know, all this. They were puppets of the Japanese imperialists who were brutally oppressing uh, the Korean people. And, you know, the, to the South Korean public, this was, you know, horrendous. They hated this. These, they had been suffering un, under Japanese colonialism for so long. The Japanese were extremely brutal 
they tried to perpetrate a myth that the Korean people were just Japanese and they banned the, they banned the Korean language at one point. They would execute people for uh, any type of opposition. Uh, they looted the resources of the country. It was a uh, horrendous uh, colonialism of the country. And the United States put those uh, Koreans who worked as puppets for the Japanese back in power in the South. And so uh, the, the stage was set for hostility between the North and the South already. And uh, there were, according to, like, if you actually look into, like, credible sources, like American sources even, um, the you know, it wasn't anything like this video, like how they say, oh, the North just invaded out of nowhere. For a long time, there were skirmishes on the border back and forth and incursions back and forth. And uh, Bruce Cummings, who is an American historian, he's basically recognized as like the best American historian on Korea. Um, he speaks Korean. He's been to North and South Korea multiple times. He's gotten awards from South Korea. Uh, he lectures for like U.S. government, even U.S. government uh, people. He even lectures for them. He's considered like probably the top American source. And he says that he talks about this and he's written numerous books about how before uh, the Korean People's Army, North Korea, pushed south. There was constant back and forth, and there were incursions by South Korea into the north. So this whole thing was set. The stage was set. And the way he describes it is basically uh, there was a civil war going on, and the United States basically interjected itself in the middle of it. Honestly, I think that, I mean, that sort of tells you that it's not North Korea that's the aggressor. It's much more complicated. But even that, it's a little bit, um, that gives too much credit to the South Korean side because we have to remember the South Korean side, they weren't equal players to the North. These were puppets of the Japanese imperialists who were extremely brutal to the Koreans. And then they were puppets of the U.S. installed by the United States. They weren't like patriotic revolutionaries like the North Koreans and Kim Il-sung. And so... Eventually, when the North, like so-called invaded, actually like responded and decided to push back the puppet government of the South, the Southern, the Southern forces, uh, the puppet forces of South Korea, they, they tumbled, they fell, they were like a house of cards. North Korea was able to take, liberate 90% of the country and push the South Korean forces all the way to this tiny section in the very South of the country. And you have to ask yourself, if South Korea was this democracy that the U.S. set up and North Korea was this brutal dictatorship and supposedly puppets of the Soviets, as they claim, total nonsense, um, why is it that, you know, the South Korean people, you know, didn't take up arms? Why is it that the North Koreans were able to push in so easily? And in fact, when the, when the North Koreans, uh, and the Korean People's Army, uh, liberated these areas in South Korea, huge demonstrations, people came out, uh, you know, people came out in masses to celebrate the Korean People's Army um, and liberation of Seoul, huge crowds coming out with the DPRK flag celebrating the Korean People's Army. And interestingly, during the Battle of Seoul, when the Korean People's Army liberated Seoul, uh, not only were they, they were fighting against the South Korean forces, but the United States warships and bomber planes heavily were trying to bomb the Korean People's Army, and they could not stop the force of the Korean People's Army, and they took Seoul, and they eventually drove all the way to the south. And during that war, the United States really underestimated the strength of the Korean People's Army and, uh, and the effectiveness of the Korean People's Army. Because again, they'd been fighting for so long in guerrilla warfare in Manchuria and in the rest of China for, and in Korea um, against the Japanese for so long. They really had a lot of battle experience and they really knew what they were doing. They were very strong fighters. And if you look at like a lot of the statements of US generals and politicians, there's this racist arrogance to it that they think because they're uh, Asians, they're saying these Koreans, they can't fight, we'll be able to, one of them even said, like, uh, we'll be able to beat them with one hand tied behind their back. And the United States got knocked on its ass by the Korean People's Army. They got driven all the way to the south. During the Korean War, that's the only time a U.S. general was captured. The Korean People's Army captured a U.S. general that never happened in history before. Um, but despite that, despite the effectiveness of the Korean People's Army, the United States 
uh, really uh, was extremely brutal against Korea. Uh, th it's interesting because Korea, it's called the Forgotten War. And a lot of people don't know much about it. But you know something? The United States dropped more bombs on Korea than the U.S. dropped in all of the Pacific theater. Wow. Which is crazy to think about. More bombs on Korea than the entire Pacific theater, including bombing Japan. Um, not in, of course, nukes is something different, but as far as like the, the raw bombs drop, the U.S. dropped more bombs on Korea than during the Pacific, all of the Pacific theater. And uh, Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea, which people might not realize, Pyongyang before the war was actually an industrial city. It wasn't like uh, a small city. It was, a, it was an industrial urbanized city with a lot of industry, big buildings. And uh, with the U.S. bombing, there wasn't uh, there wasn't a building left standing more than one one story. They completely flattened the city. They um, and other cities uh, that was not just Pyongyang, but that was done basically throughout. And there's a very telling quote from a U.S. general, U.S. General Curtis LeMay in Korea. Um, this is what he said. He said. We went over there and fought the war and eventually burned down every town in North Korea anyway, some way or another. Over a period of three years or so, we killed off, what, 20% of the population? That's U.S. General Curtis LeMay on the Korean War. That's wow. a very telling admission from a U.S. general uh, in the war of what the U.S. did. Um, and it's so unknown. And this that's why you know, there is such a strong hatred for U.S. imperialism in Korea. And if you don't understand what the U.S. did in this heavy bombing of this country, um, you, you, you can't understand what's going on today. And, and the, uh, thing, the, thing, the thing, too, to remember is that, like, we're talking about a pretty small geographic size. It's not like Korea's not like Japan or China that are pretty sizable. I think... In terms of geography, Korea is probably comparable to like California or the U.S. West Coast. So imagine if people like I'm out here in L.A., right? Imagine if people completely bombed San Francisco and L.A. to the smithereens and having to rebuild that anew and being bombed more than any other place in the Pacific theater. I mean, it's just crazy. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and again, it's it's largely it's it's really unfortunate because it's largely unknown by uh, most Americans. Um, and uh, also, besides that, uh, again, going back to Bruce Cummings, who's the American historian, who's basically recognized as like the best top American historian, even by like the mainstream. And again, he's lectured for the U.S. government. Even he's been to Korea multiple times and won awards from South Korea. Even he said, according to him. Um, the uh, the massacres that were taking place in Korea, because there's there was at the time there was a lot of propaganda by the U.S. claiming that the North Koreans, uh, the communists, were committing mass massacres and stuff. But actually, Bruce Cummings points out that the massacres were six to one, and that for every one massacre perpetrated by communist forces, six were perpetrated by the South Korean puppet government and the United States. So it was a six to one with the, with uh, South Korea and the United States committing the vast, you know, un, if unmeasurable atrocities on the U.S. and South Korean side. And uh, he also highlights one particularly disgusting event. And it's kind of, it makes you think of stuff nowadays, like what's going on in Syria when they talk about a gas attack. And they try to flip the script and say Assad killed these people, when in reality it turns out that it was the Western-backed terrorists that killed these civilians. In the Korean War, the U.S. was doing something similar. There's a really disgusting short film uh, narrated by uh, Audrey Hepburn uh, called uh, Crime of Korea or something like that. And it shows uh, pits of dead bodies, and it's him talking about uh, the communists killed carried out this massacre and blah, blah, blah. Well, it turns out that massacre was carried out by South Korean forces. And Bruce Cummings documents this. And it's, 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 it's recorded. It's not just like something that's up for debate. It's re on record. It was a massacre carried out by the U.S. puppet forces with the U.S. military watching it all happen. 
um, again, six to one, the South Koreans carried out six massacres for every one uh, massacre uh, carried out by the North. Uh, so the atrocities were way, you know, sometimes people try to say, well, there's atrocities on all sides, blah, 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 six times the amount on the so-called democracy side against the so-called totalitarian side. Um, and so the the Korean War, that's uh, that's a very important, the historical context. Again, these videos and stuff like the example you brought up and any of them, they'll never talk about this stuff. Um, it's... it's um, you know, sometimes when they talk about the Vietnam War, they'll talk a little bit about the atrocities. But when it comes to Korea, they'll never get into this stuff. Right. And uh, but it's all it's all recorded by mainstream sources, like actual like serious mainstream sources. And again, like you could go on the Wikipedia uh, article for the Korean War. You don't even have to take my word for it. Look at it has the list of like the generals on each side. You can look at the South Korean generals and. Uh, Many of their generals were, you could see, they fought for Japan. They fought for Manchukuo, the puppet state of Manchukuo, and mm. uh, Imperial Japan. Um, so that just shows you these people, they, they, they were puppets for Japanese imperialism, and then they were basically worked as puppets for the United States. These were not Korean patriots. They were the enemies of Korean patriots. The Korean patriots hated them. And eventually, this is another fact that's really important after the Korean War um, well actually the Korean War uh, went from 1950 to 1953 and it ended in an armistice agreement um, technically there hasn't been a peace treaty signed technically this there's just an armistice uh, agreement so there isn't like a peace treaty so technically like the war still exists um, but you know considering like the myth that South Korea was a democracy and North Korea is a dictatorship. Sigmund Rhee, the, the pro-U.S. leader in the South, he was overthrown in 1960 in the April Revolution, which was a popular revolution of uh, South Koreans. So the South Koreans hated him. He was a U.S.-installed puppet, and the South Koreans rejected him and overthrew him. There was no such thing like that in North Korea. They, there was no... Kim Il-sung was loved by the North Koreans. There was no such uprising or anything in South Korea. This was, uh, you know, he was overthrown because the South Koreans hated this leader that was supposedly, according to the U.S. narrative, was defending democracy. Well, the South Koreans themselves, they, they didn't want anything to do with him. They overthrew him. Um, and after him, there were other leaders, a uh, very well-known dictator in South Korea that they had for a long time. And the U.S. even acknowledges he was a dictator was uh, Park Chung-hee, mm. and uh, he was in for a long time. He was he a bad was actually, motherfucker. He was horrible. Yeah. yeah, and he was another one of these examples. Seaman Rhee, I don't think he actually was a puppet of the Japanese. Yeah. He wasn't fighting for Korea's independence like Kim Il-sung, but he wasn't like a puppet of the Japanese. The people around him were. But Park Chung-hee was one of them. He was wearing a Japanese uniform fighting against his, his own Korean people. And he even was such a sellout that he changed his name to a Japanese name. Oh, my God. He, he denounced his Korean name and changed his name to a Japanese name. And then he tries to claim to be, like, the, the real Korean leader of, of South Korea and that North Korea isn't the real one, but he's the real one. Um, and again, <laughs> you know, these puppets, they can't keep their houses in order. You know, he what ends up happening to him? He ends up getting shot by one of his own bodyguards and killed at a, at a, this, at an, when an argument breaks out at a dinner. One of his own bodyguards shoots him dead when an argument breaks out. And that's what ends wow. his reign. Uh, so the first leader, Sigmund Rhee, he gets overthrown by the South Korean people. Then a little bit later, Park Chung-hee, he gets killed by his own security people. Um, the, the, the puppets, they, they can't even keep their house in order. Um, but uh, after the war, a very, another very important point uh, that is rarely talked about, but it's, it's a matter of record. The U.S. government acknowledged it at the time. Mainstream sources, if they actually go in depth, they admit this, that North Korea was way ahead of South Korea in the 50s, 60s, and that started to shift in the 70s and 80s. But uh, Bruce Cummings, again, talks about this uh, how North Korea, according to the U.S. government, everyone knew North Korea was way ahead of South Korea. And the United States was terrified of this fact. 
And that eventually led to, during the rule of Park Chung-hee, the United States like uh, uh, fu heavily funded like South Korean industries to try and artificially start up like an actual economy in South Korea because South Korea was so poor. Um, and they knew that they were going to, if that continued, they were going to lose and the South Korean people uh, would eventually overthrow and uh, uh, join with the North. Um, and during this time period, there was, this is also not very well known. There was like very, uh, there was an insurgency in the South, similar, very similar to like how there was the, the insurgency in South Vietnam by the uh, South, um, by the uh, National Liberation Front or so-called Viet Cong. There was a similar thing, not as high intensity, nowhere near as high intensity, but there was armed conflict in the South. And in the 60s, there's something known as the uh, Second Korean War, um, which was uh, like border skirmishes on the DMZ and also some fighting and skirmishes within South Korea. It was very unstable. Um, and that is probably what led to Singman Rhee's bodyguard killing him. Some dispute because the, there was so much tension and so, in, so much instability and it was such a failure in South Korea um, at the time that, you know, tensions got so heated that he ended up shooting the, the leader of South Korea dead. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, again, something that's always, you know, that's, that's rarely acknowledged. I remember once, actually, seeing a CNN article years ago that mentioned that South, North Korea used to be ahead of South Korea. And I was shocked that they admitted that, actually. That's very rare that you'll see that. So that's crazy, and I think once one thing that's important to for context as well the international role of quote unquote South Korea is like it, during that period in the sixties and seventies the South Korean government was also supporting right wing evangelical Christian governments in Guatemala that was killing and murdering indigenous communist Guatemalans by the thousands, especially later on in the eighties under Efraín Ríos Montt. And the South Korean government has also defended and helped arm and train death squads in El Salvador and Honduras. And the role of the South Korean government was very reactionary at that time. And it's just really interesting to put the pieces together in a puzzle because South Korea was not only oppressing people domestically, especially with like the Jeju Island massacre, but also internationally people all over the global south fighting for their liberation because south korea was part of that camp of anti-communism and i've never met so many rabid anti-communists as right wings quote unquote south koreans and um the the role of evangelical christianity which you know maybe we can touch later on is is crazy and throughout this whole time you know dprk resisting empire support you know, we're talking about the 60s and 70s now supporting the Cuban Revolution, standing in solidarity with the Cuban Revolution, standing in solidarity with Salvador Allende, the leftist Chilean president uh, of Chile, uh, supporting the Palestinian struggle, supporting Syria. And, and so it's like even though DPRK is being attacked with sanctions and all this nonsense, they're still supporting people internationally. The Panthers, the Black Panthers, of course, something that we we're talking about earlier on, right? It's like one of the things that's very little known, look at one of the earliest covers of the Black Panther newspaper where they have images of themselves visiting DPRK, Huey Nguyen and other people in DPRK meeting with Kim Il-sung. And we're never taught about that, right? You have idiots like Vosh and other leftist so-called YouTubers who are like hyping up the Panthers, but then they repeat the same mainstream media propaganda about the DPRK. What's well, like, hey, do you know that the original Panthers actually supported the DPRK, were in solidarity with them? And, you know, it's just like this purposeful division, right? The, in, the DPRK during that time period was so international, still is internationalist, and we almost never hear about it. Oh, yeah. And it was interesting, you're mentioning South Korea's uh, basically uh, uh, working as an agent for U.S. imperialism around the world, like out out for hire, you know, for the U.S. policy around the world. South Korea during Park Chung-hee even sent troops to fight in Vietnam. And that's something that is, you know, it, it's really horrible for South Korea. You know, not only is South Korea occupied by the U.S. and the puppet of the U.S., but they're basically, you know, put sending financially desperate poor South Koreans, because again, South Korea is very impoverished at this time period sending poor South Koreans off to fight in Vietnam. 
on the side of U.S. imperialism, uh, the really uh, horrible uh, part of the history. Um, but also on the other side, North Korea, of course, was supporting uh, uh, the Viet, uh, the true Vietnamese uh, fighters, uh, the, the Vietnamese fighting for liberation, North Vietnam, uh, North Vietnam, the National Liberation Front against uh, imperialism, and like you said, all over the world supported Syria, supported Egypt, uh, supported all over Africa, uh, Angola, Mozambique, Zimbabwe. Um, uh, Ethiopia, all over uh, Cuba, like you said, all over the world. Every, you know, that's the that's the amazing thing about North Korea. Even though you know they're not a huge country, it's not like the Soviet Union or China that has a huge amount of resources. They don't have a lot of resources, but you know what? Just about anywhere where people are fighting for their freedom, North Korea was there supporting them. Oh yeah, most definitely, a hundred percent. And moving more to the present, um, there's this interesting video clip about there's this youtuber he produced a video called north korea the most depressing country right and again going into some of the the way dprk is covered today it's portrayed as a closed off society militarized and to some degree there's an element of truth to it and i think all of your historical context is extremely valuable in watching this clip because we understand that the dprk has been at war is still at war since day one so they have to be protective. So I want to play this clip, get your reaction, and then maybe you can tell, uh, tell us a little bit about what is Juche and how does Juche differ a little bit from uh, traditional socialism, Marxism, Leninism. So this is sure, the this is the clip that uh, that I was telling you about. North Korea is not a joke. It's one of the worst countries in the world. It's isolated. It's dangerous. It's strict. But above all, it's depressing. So here is my time inside North Korea. I visited North Korea by taking a 24-hour train from Beijing to the border. Here, you can only enter as part of an organized tour group. And now we have to take a train to North Korea for 24 hours. And the minute you cross the border, you enter a whole new world. Soldiers will inspect everything you own. They check every picture and every page of every book that you have. Please do not take photos of the person in military uniform. They make sure you don't carry any Bibles or Korans or any religious texts because religion is banned. No political books, no nude magazines, no internet transmitters, and no sensitive information. Soldiers even take your phone to check which pictures you have. And it all makes sense, because this country is like a prison. Inside of it, you'll see extreme poverty and extreme isolation, with no freedom, no Wi-Fi, no Facebook, no access to the outside this place, this world. Place, this place is such a close community that everything they produce is produced internally, which means that there's no trade or very little trade with other nations. And no matter how much they try to hide it, North Korea is poor. On the highway, there are very few cars because people can't afford them. Oh, this is the main highway of North Korea, right here. Inside homes, there is no stable power because it keeps going out. <laughs> power went off again. Outside homes, poverty is apparent and the people are trapped inside. <laughs> say hi. Hi. What, what do you want to say to the camera? <laughs> they have a beautiful culture, beautiful traditions, amazing sports events, circuses, and dances. They are proud people, but the problem is... They don't matter. What matters in North Korea is the missile, the tank, the soldiers, the fake illusion of power. Military displays are everywhere in the country and leaders are on every building. This is what the country chose to focus on at every cost. And not this. My time in North Korea only lasted five days 
and it was orchestrated to see what the government wants you to see. And on my train out of the country, I got checked one last time by soldiers. We just got checked. And luckily they didn't steal our videos. And as soon as we were in the clear, I cried. I cried for the people there. There is no solution for the average North Korean. Their country is and will remain a prison. What a fucking idiot, man. This guy's a, a joke. I think that the part that pissed me off the most is that he's taking a selfie with the the Korean dude and, and, and the Korean people are warm and loving people. And he generally thinks he's like, oh, this guy's nice. And he's just like making fun of him, clowning him. You know, the music, so much wizardry in, in the videos and he's pissed off that he can't get his pornos and facebook on in, in the dprk and it's just classic western arrogance chauvinism about the dprk but this leads into like what we we're talking about about juche right because the the korean people have been forced not out of choice they have been forced into being self-reliant because of sanctions because of the lack of international solidarity with the DPRK, they've been forced to look inward to be protective. Tell us a little bit about Juche, what exactly it is and how it differs more or less from traditional socialism. Yeah, if I could real quick on that video, uh, not to say too much, but that guy, <laughs> if I remember correctly, you know who that guy is? He's a Palestinian who Palestinians hate. Oh, really? He, oh, yeah, shit, I didn't know I remember, that. That's crazy. If I remember correctly, that guy... He's this guy that is basically like trying to be a sellout to Israel and be like oh this Palestinian God. face for Israeli propaganda. And yeah, he's Palestinians hate that guy. He's like a total <laughs> sellout. He's doing this. Look at that. He's doing this propaganda oh, for U.S. imperialism and Zionism because North Korea, uh, Israel hates North Korea. But um, I mean, yeah, so much, so much propaganda. You know, it's funny. CNN even, mainstream media, they sent a journalist to North Korea in 2017. And he actually, he contradicts everything this guy is saying. It's rare to see actually CNN talk about this. They talk about how actually North Korea is doing pretty good. Their economy is growing quite a bit each year. Uh, he went to like stores. They're full of consumer goods. He went to a cell phone store where they make their own cell phones and stuff. And people are buying cell phones. Um, he talks to people. Um, people are doing good. People are living normally. It's not like the, uh, you know, they want to make it seem as though it's like still like the 1990s when they were having severe economic problems. Even, even CNN mainstream corporate media reported that. And you could see that video on the flame of liberation. Uh, I have the video up on the flame of liberation. CNN actually tells the truth about, uh, North Korea. Uh, it, yeah. Please subscribe to flame of liberation. The, the link is in the description. Yeah. Um, but as far as Juche, uh, yeah, um, yeah, Juche, it's a very interesting uh, concept. And uh, the way what you talked about earlier was very interesting about uh, the Sino Soviet split, the split between China and the Soviet Union. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of pressure for uh, Kim Il sung and the DPRK to f go fully on one side or the other. And the DPRK understood that on one hand, that's wrong because on one hand you need to maintain your independence and on the other hand it's also wrong because both countries neither country is an enemy china is not an enemy the soviet union is not an enemy and kim il sung felt that while he disagreed with say khrushchev and his uh his um lies about stalin and changes to the soviet economy kim il sung was against that and made sure that that wouldn't happen in north korea at the same time, he strongly disagreed with the policy that China was taking with this insane notion of Soviet social imperialism and these other ridiculous ultra-left uh, right. stances that China was taking at the time. And the DPRK took a, ver took a firm hand domestically against people within the party who were trying to put forward uh, anti-Soviet nonsense. And on the other hand, this revisionist uh, nonsense of trying to liberalize and, and so on. So they took an independent position. They, made tr they maintained their close relations with the Soviet Union and China. And they always tried to bring the Soviet Union and China back together. That was something that they wanted. And they talked about how 
the division between within the world communist movement only helps imperialism and that's so true when you look around the world where you have conflicts in certain countries where you have the pro-china communists fighting against the pro-soviet union communists uh and often uh this china supporting u.s imperialism around the world against uh, national liberation forces to the extent of even supporting the overthrow of uh um allende you know okay. ridiculous insane conclusions that they came to with this ultra left nonsense um one very tangible thing that kim il-sung achieved in the sino-soviet split was uh these uh, foolish Red Guards in China were stopping uh, trains of Soviet uh, aid to Vietnam, which is insane. These people are lunatics, you know, they call themselves communists, and they're stopping aid to the Vietnamese fighting against U.S. imperialism. And Kim Il-sung convinced Mao to crack down on those Red Guards and make sure that the Soviet aid would go to Vietnam. Um, and so, uh, from very early on, the DPRK took a very strong independent position, and this debunks the lies of that uh, North Korea, Kim Il Sung, they were puppets of the of the Soviet Union or something. It's complete nonsense because, or of China, because uh, the DPRK took a completely independent position and didn't fully agree with either Khrushchev or Mao, and they took their own position um, and. They were always very extremely strong on self-reliance um, and uh, independence. And uh, Juche itself, um, it's often mistake. There's there, there's a lot of, needless to say, there's so many mischaracterizations of it. One uh, that I think is obviously from more of a uh, coming from a more legitimate place, like not like the slander, but it's still a misconception of it is that it's simply Korean socialism. Juche mm. is actually more than just Korean socialism. It's more than just Korean Marxism, Leninism. It's actually um, a further a furthering of uh, communist and socialist philosophy and bringing it to a whole nother level of development, of scientific uh, development. And uh, some people criticize North Korea for um, changing uh, like use of the term Marxism, Leninism for Juche. And um, on one hand, some communists and people on the left say that as like, oh, pr that's proof that they're not revolutionary anymore. And then some like weirdos try to say, oh, that proves they're not really <laughs> communists and they're like nationalist, third positionist or whatever, blah, blah, blah. I've even uh, heard some ultras call them fascists. Right, yeah, it's <laughs> nonsense. Right. It, it, if you look at anything of what Juche is, it references heavily Marx and Lenin. It makes it clear. They talk of communism and socialism. They reference Marx and Lenin. Marx and Lenin are called the classics in North Korea. And they talk about the classics in North Korea. They're talking about Marx and Lenin. Uh, Marxism, 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 Leninism, Marx's writings, Lenin writing, or Lenin's writings, uh, Stalin. Those are all part of North Korea's curriculum, what they teach children. They teach them that. It's not like they're trying to hide that in their, this bullshit about how, oh, Juche is Korean nationalism. It's complete nonsense. Uh, what it is, is, you know, from the Marxist perspective, the Marxist perspective on Marxism, Leninism, communism is that it's a science. It's not a stagnant dogma. And the idea of what Juche is, is that it's taking uh, the principles of Marxism, Leninism and developing it further. Um, and for these people that are opposed to that, it's basically they're viewing Marxism as a dogma. It's a religion stagnant. Right. And what Juche did was it brought about new ideas um, uh, that are... Now, now, it's interesting because it can be kind of confusing to some people because the way Juche is described is that it's a, an original philosophy. But on, that's on one hand, but on the other hand, it's it's rooted in Marxism, Leninism, and it could not exist without Marxism, Leninism. Um, and again, Kim Il Sung, Kim Jong Il, their writings on Juche, they reference Marx and Lenin, and that's basically the foundation of it. Um, but the reason why they they came about with Juche was because they felt that there were sh certain shortcomings within Marxism, similar to how Lenin found some shortcomings within. Uh, Marxism, and he brought it to what is Marxism-Leninism, and 
by doing so, and they say this all the time, they never reject Marxism-Leninism. Anytime they talk about Juche, they make it clear they're not rejecting Marxism-Leninism. And there's an excellent quote from Kim Il-sung on the topic. And again, for these fools who try to say that Juche is somehow Korean nationalism or mm, something, yeah. uh, this is what Kim Il-sung said about Juche. Quote, the Juche ideology is based on Marx's principle, workers of all countries unite, and is in full accord with proletarian internationalism. That's Kim Il-sung on Juche. And um, so it's fully, it's fully in line with Marxism, Marxism-Leninism. It's basically a further development of it. And it's not something simply f uh, like Korean socialism. It's, 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 it's a development of communist philosophy more generally. Yeah, most definitely. I think that's a great way of putting it. And that's something that people have to understand. Like Marxism is not a static dogma. It's not a religion. It's a science that you adapt and mold to your national reality. If you're in Korea, you're going to blend Marxism and Leninism to the Korean conditions. If you're in Latin America, you're going to mold it to the Latin American conditions, et cetera, et cetera. And you have to adapt it. And a lot of the ultras who like to shit on DPRK and Juche, they don't really understand that. They don't really understand what it means to live in an impoverished global South country where you have to rely on your people. And when you're under attack by sanctions, it's something that's horrible. And DPRK continues to be attacked by sanctions. And for just, just some background as well, for people who are watching and listening for the first time, uh, the Sino-Soviet split in the 60s, I think around 1961, between the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China where you have in the Soviet Union, the Khrushchev faction that became revisionist and became uh, liberalizing the economy and started moving more, uh, moving away from uh, Stalin and Marxism, Leninism. But then you also have on the Chinese side, China moving in a more ultra left direction, adopting some more uh, radical policies that were making as as comrade flame of liberation was saying painting the soviet union as a, a rising imperialist power they would say stuff like neither moscow nor washington every no one is good enough we're the only real revolutionaries and a lot of the ultra left still use that kind of logic in their thinking and so the dprk and also cuba as well were kind of like i mean cuba i would say was more aligned with the soviet union but like Overall, the, the DPRK was kind of like, look, we need to maintain unity, imperialism, U.S. imperialism is the main enemy, Wall Street is the main enemy, we can't lose sight and focus. And that's why I have mad respect for Kim Il-sung and, and the, the Korean revolution, because they were always about unity, maintaining unity among the socialist camp, which is something that is so not uh, often forgotten, you know. Um, one thing I want to play, uh, comrade, because it's been really dope talking to you so far. By the way, shout out to everybody who's watching and listening, Parasocialite, B-Level, Big Teal, A.O. Hillary, everybody who's on. Um, we're speaking with Flame of Liberation. Please subscribe to his channel. Link is in the description. I want to play a clip from... But would it be a, possible uh, yeah. just first mm -hmm. maybe to go a little bit more into Juche? Because I actually yeah, didn't really say what the, um, uh, what the actual development was that they did. Yeah, um, go for it. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, again, it was uh, basically the idea is that it's it's correcting some of the shortcomings of Marxism and Marxism-Leninism. And what they felt was that, um, again, what they uphold Marxism, Marxism-Leninism, and dialectical and historical materialism, but they felt that um, uh, there needed to be something talking about more so uh, the nature of man. Um, mm. And what they emphasize is uh, there's a slogan, man is the master of his destiny. And they talk about how man is a social being and he has creativity and uh, has a strive for independence. And um, that's something that uh, the significance of that is that while they're materialists, they also feel that there's something sort of missing in that while being materialists and talking about how uh, humans are a product of like material conditions, they also state that... Uh, man is not a slave to his environment and that because of his creativity and drive for independence he's able to um he's able to uh, determine his destiny basically and that um so through that they they um and you could see that's sort of related to 
their history of fighting for independence and how even though they were a small country, they they fought and made, uh, they they very strongly felt that even though, uh, you know, they, they, um, they had, you know, such difficult circumstances and they had, for example, in the Sino-Soviet split, you had, uh, say, much bigger powers tr uh, sort of um, trying to pull the country on one side or the other. They felt that they uh, don't, they're not going to be like, um, uh, they're, they're going to, f they're going to fight and make their own reality. They're not going to be like a slave to the, uh, the, the prevailing situation. They're going to fight to make the situation that they want. And so uh, th this is very significant because um, while Marx talked about like class struggle, struggle and all these things, that's extremely important. But also uh, this concept of juche, where uh, uh, the the the, um, the struggle for independence uh, within uh, humankind, um, uh, man strive for independence. That this is an extremely important part of uh, of uh, human nature, so to speak, um, in general, and that class struggle. Um, and struggle for national liberation is, is related to this and that it's the struggle for uh, man's independence. Um, and that this is one of the things that uh, separates humans from animals and that humans have this uh, desire for freedom and independence. Um, and it's, it's very interesting. I would encourage people to read Kim Il-sung's and Kim Jong-il's writings on it because I think that it definitely is, it, it is a very important development uh, into, um, into, you know, socialist science, uh, communist science, uh, and it's something that, again, similar to how, you know, Lenin, uh, he disagreed with certain things of Marx, and he sort of uh, improved Marxism and created Marxism-Leninism, Juche sort of continues that tradition in the sense that it's, it's rooted in Marxism-Leninism, but it also tries to uh, improve it and strengthen it and build upon it to another level. It's beautiful. I mean, it's something that is very unique to the Korean conditions, but just the language is like very affirming and upholding humans as the most valuable commodity, human life, human capacity, unleashing the power of the human being and the spirit is something that ac can accomplish so much. And I think that's why it's cool that the red star, the the one of the main logos of socialism, represents like the five fingers of the hand and the the continents and the unity. Like you know, if you unite all of your fingers into a fist, it becomes stronger and you can accomplish so much more. So it's really beautiful to see that just the level of philosophy, science, and and poetry in the DPRK, their analogy, their understanding of Marxism and and revolution. I want to play a clip from this documentary that we've both seen. It was created by a patriotic Korean, not necessarily from the DPRK, but a Korean who supports a unification, anti-imperialist. And this is a documentary, The West Through the Eyes of, of North Korea. It's on YouTube, again, not from the DPRK, but from a patriotic Korean. Uh, and this is kind of flipping, right? Because a lot of the focus on mainstream media from the West is like, let's go in and study these North Koreans. This is how they live and think. So this is kind of flipping it, right? This is kind of showing how people in the West view and understand reality. I want to play a clip from it, uh, get your reaction, Comrade Flame of Liberation, and, and we'll uh, wrap it up from there. Film about psychological warfare. A specific type of warfare designed to distract, misinform, but trust me, trust me, and anesthetize the brain. It has many disguises and is used against every one of them. Against them and against them. Of course, such Machiavellian activity requires 
disguise, which is why propagandists call themselves the public relations industry. But do not be fooled. Public relations and propaganda are interchangeable. And it is the massive public relations industry that is designed to alter perception, reshape reality, and manufacture consent. A Hollywood set designer was brought in to create a $200,000 backdrop for official war briefings. Today, America alone has more public relations propagandists and reporters, which means that nearly half of what people in the West hear, see, or read is written by professional liars. Professional liars whose job it is to keep people in front of their televisions, reading gossip magazines, eating vast amounts of toxic food, and shopping, always shopping for the latest fashions and trends. That's the ideal for propagandists. And great efforts are made in trying to achieve and maintain that ideal. Anything that keeps the masses from organizing themselves and asking important questions about what their masters are really up to. The 1960s, a period of heightened awareness and rebellion against the establishment, with students leading the resistance. But when the situation seems to be getting out of hand, the establishment ordered it to be stopped, and the propagandists moved quickly to lead the young people away from dangerous protests into such fashionable protests. That was then. This is now. Fashion. Celebrity. Sex. Music. Technology. Any kind of revolution except the social revolution. In this film, we will reveal the methods used by the propagandists to control populations such a base film, any revolution but social revolution, the mass distraction of people in the West. People in the DPRK are more knowledgeable about the West and the oppression going on and how people are controlled. They just know more about the world in, in terms of like understanding politics and imperialism. And people in the US were too distracted with IG and OnlyFans and all, we're all bombarded with all this media propaganda and nonsense and people here don't even know about the dprk what the reality is and and it's just cool to see the reverse because we're constantly told like we're smarter we're more informed we're better we're free but we are slaves to these corporate giants who control us distract us sell us poison we're in more enslaved than the people of the dprk and we have the arrogance as westerners to be like oh we're more free you know so it's just Crazy, but uh, Comrade Flame of Liberation, your response, reaction, and just overall kind of wrapping up, um, any good sources for people to watch on the DPRK? Yeah, that was great how you put it right there, how, you know, the American public is so brainwashed to think that, you know, we are free. When you look at the way we live as a society, and people are waking up to this more and more, but it's like, the media, the propaganda has the audacity to tell, to try and fool people who don't even have health care, don't even have education, people who are going homeless, people who don't have jobs, you know, you know, houses are falling apart in the country because of neoliberal capitalism. We can't, you know, we have infrastructure falling apart. We don't have health care. We don't have all these things that other countries, poor countries like North Korea, by the way, the United Nations said that North Korea's healthcare system would be the envy of any third world country. Same thing with Cuba, all these socialist countries that we're told aren't free. Well, the reason why they say that these countries, quote unquote, aren't free is because this, the same people that deny us working class people health care are the ones who run the media, these, the huge corporations, 
uh, they are the ones who want to demonize these countries that actually provide for the working class. Um, so, yeah, it's it's, it's it, you put that really well. How you know we're told that the North Koreans are brainwashed and don't have freedom. In the United States, you know, you don't have health care, you don't have education, you don't have uh, stable housing, you don't have st job stability. Um, you know, the United States should really work on fixing these problems before telling other countries that actually give their people health care and housing and education, uh, you know, how to run things. Um, but as far as sources, yeah, that, I think that's very important because it's hard to, it, you know, with the mainstream media propaganda, it's hard to come by sources. But one of the, you know, someone I mentioned, Bruce Cummings, he's a, he's a great academic. Um, he's considered basically... Uh, by the mainstream, he's considered like one of the top or the top American academics on Korea. He's written numerous books. Again, he's been to North and South Korea numerous times. He's won awards from the South Korean government. Even um, he lectures for like he's lectured for like the U.S. government. Even so, he's considered a top, uh, maybe the top American historian on Korea. And again, his name is Bruce Cummings. Um, Another good, there's a really good book written by um, uh, Stephen Goins. Uh, yes, yeah, Stephen Goins. Um, he wrote a book called uh, Patriots, Traitors, and Empire, The Story of Korea's Struggle for Freedom. And that's a great title because that really captures it. Because at its essence, the Korean War and the situation in Korea, North Korea is the, is, the, is the government that was formed by the Korean patriots. Kim Il-sung, they fought, they shed their blood to liberate Korea from Japanese imperialism, while the southern government was formed of the traitors who changed their names, denounced their Korean identity, and fought for Japan and killed their own uh, Korean compatriots. And then they went and put on a U.S. uniform to oppress their uh, Korean, uh, their fellow Koreans. So that title... Uh, Patriots, Traitors, and Empires, The Story of Korea's Struggle for, Liber uh, for Freedom. That's by uh, Stephen Goins. I recommend that. And uh, also there's a good YouTube channel uh, called uh, Songun007. Uh, Songun007. Uh, he puts out videos. Uh, I believe he's with the Korean Friendship Association in the UK. And he puts out information uh, debunking... Uh, debunking, you know, various propaganda against the DPRK, and he puts out videos, like, directly from the DPRK. If you want to see, like, uh, like information that the DPRK puts out, he puts out some of that as well. So, again, that's uh, Sungun007. Um, so, yeah, those three, I would say, are, are good. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, it, you know, dealing with the propaganda against North Korea, it, it's so disgusting because it's there's like so many levels to it that it's hard to even keep track of. Like in that video where he's talking about a poor and everything. Well, first of all, he doesn't talk about how the U.S. even said that North Korea was way more wealthy than South Korea in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, he doesn't talk about that historical context. But even so, he's talking about how horrible North Korea supposedly is and how poor it is. Well, I don't think, is he going to try and deny the fact that North Korea, the DPRK, put a satellite in space before South Korea? Right. That's a fact. Is he going to deny that? I mean, all, that that's not me saying that. That's not, you know, North Korean propaganda, so to speak. That's <laughs> just a fact. North Korea put a satellite in space before South Korea. Um, yeah. Another good point uh, as far as Korea is that, you know, there was this whole thing of how, oh, the only reason why, you know, the Soviets put Kim Il-sung in power, blah, blah, blah. Well, if that were the case, how come... The North Korean government stood and was strong for all these years, you know, throughout the Cold War. The Soviets and China pulled their troops out of North Korea. The United States didn't pull its troops out of South Korea till today. The U.S. troops are in South Korea. So that also tells you who's the independent country. North Korea is the country that doesn't have foreign troops. South Korea is chock full of U.S. troops. They've got a huge military base in the capital city, Seoul. Uh, and the the way that everything is set up, like the military of uh, South Korea, they don't even really have control of their own military. If a war broke out, it falls under U.S. command, so they don't have sovereignty. 
the South Korean government truly is, um, when you look at the information, it truly is a puppet government. And they don't have sovereignty. And all this information, you know, the South Koreans themselves know this. Again, uh, in the 90s, there was a whole truth and reconciliation about all the massacres and horrible atrocities committed by the South Korean government. And this stuff came out. The South Koreans themselves know this. The unfortunate thing is most Americans don't know anything about this stuff and they just think North Korea is an evil totalitarian state and South Korea is just, uh, you know, the place where they get their uh, their electronics from and K-pop and some other things like that. Um, <laughs> Did you see that video, yeah. by the way, when the people from DPRK saw K-pop at the Olympics <laughs> and they were like, what the fuck? Yeah. Oh, yep. man, that was crazy. Yeah, yeah that, that that's very... That, that tells you a lot as far as the, the cultures in the two countries. And, um, but another, I mean, I also want to emphasize again, the first time the United States fought against Koreans, it wasn't against communists, wasn't against Kim Il-sung. It was before Kim Il-sung was born. It was before the Soviet Union. It was in 1871 when the United States invaded and attacked uh, the Joseon Kingdom of Korea trying to open them up for trade. And that's the thing, U.S. imperialism, it was imperialism then, and it was imperialism in the 1950s, and it's imperialism now. It's just that they have a different face to it. They change it a little bit. You know, before then, it was kind of like openly racism, uh, white man's burden, all that stuff in the 1800s. Then uh, during the Korean War, it still was racist, but then it was also like anti-communism. And now we talked about this before, how imperialism has shifted. And you've talked about this a lot and you've done a lot to expose this. Uh, and others have been talking about this. And it's so true how the the woke washing of uh, imperialism, the identity politics utilization of imperialism. But the end of the, But at the end of the day, it's still taking away the sovereignty of Korea. It's subjugating Korea. It's aggression. It's colonialism against Korea still to this day. And you know why you know what reason is it is there for there to be u.s troops in south korea they should you know let the korean people decide for themselves what kind of government they have should have the united states has no right to tell the koreans how to run their country well said man i couldn't have put it better myself and um on that note i think this is a, a good place to wrap up. Again, uh, we're speaking with Comrade Flame of Liberation. Please subscribe to his channel description. The link is in the description. He has some also great content on Baathism, on Syria, on the Middle East. We have another episode that we've done on, on Syria, on Palestine. And today we spoke about the DPRK, the truth about North Korea, the DPRK. Um, it was really dope talking to you, Comrade. I hope all is well. I look forward to collabing again in the future. And thanks again, man. It was, I learned Definitely. a lot talking with you today, man. Take Thank care, bro. You. Great to be All with right, you. All right, man. Peace. Thanks.